بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله عما بعد then to continue with the explanation of ثلاثة الأصول the explanation of the three principles of Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab رحمه الله with the explanation of Shaykh Salih al-Fawzan حفظه الله then we were at the beginning of the book still on the initial treatise which the author brings from the three, as we said, the three treatises that he brings to begin the book off with and the first of those being with regard to four matters which it is obligatory that we learn and as we had the first of them being knowledge the second of them being action upon the knowledge the third of them being calling to it, calling to the knowledge, and the fourth of them being a sabr, having patience upon harm encountered upon that way. Then last time we had the evidence, because the author mentioned, as we had, that he would bring evidence, it's obligatory upon us to have awareness of Allah, an awareness of his prophet, an awareness of the religion of Islam with evidences, so he brings evidence in this book. So he mentioned the evidence for these four points, which was Surah Al-Asr, the saying of Allah the Most High, he said, and the proof is his saying, he the Most High, وَالْأَسْرْ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرْ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاسَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاسَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ Surah Al-Asr, the ayahs with the explanation, by time, mankind is certainly in loss, except for those who have iman, those who truly believe, and who perform the righteous deeds, ya Allah, and who enjoin one another with the truth, and who enjoin one another with sabr, with patience. So last time, towards the end of what we had last time, in the last lesson we had the matter of calling to knowledge, calling to the knowledge and having patience upon the knowledge, and we had the surah. And Shaykh al Fawzan explained in what we had the beginning of the surah, Wal Asr, with the explanation by time. And we had that this was an oath, that our Lord, the Exalted and Most High, swears an oath here by time. And Shaykh al Fawzan explained some of the important points that Allah the Most High does not swear by something that Allah the Most High may swear by whatever he wishes from his creation whereas we the creation may only swear an oath in the name of Allah in the name of the creator but as for the creator Allah the Most High then he may swear by whatever he wishes from the creation and he only swears by something which is something of importance and something which contains a lesson so Shaykh al-Fawzan in his explanation explains some of the important lessons which are contained in time. And then <clears throat> he reached, and the explanation reached, reached the point, which on my edition is page 31, and your edition, the Egyptian edition, which most of you have, is a different page. Anyway, <clears throat> that Sheikh Fawzan raises a question here, continuing explanation of the surah. And he raises a question, ما هو جواب القسم؟ so there is, in other words, there's been an oath here. Well, Asr, Allah the Most High has sworn an oath by time, and then the oath is sworn to affirm something. The oath is sworn to affirm something. In Arabic, what what it's sworn to sworn to affirm is called جواب القسم, literally the answer to the oath. But in English, they usually call it the complement of the oath. So Shaykh Fawzan raises the question, ما هو جواب القسم? What is the complement of this oath? I mean, what is this oath sworn to, sworn upon? Shaykh Fawzan said, it is his saying, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْر So the explanation continues here. It is the answer to this oath, the, what it's sworn, the oath is sworn about, or what it's sworn, sworn to. It is his saying, in the second ayah, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْر 
with the explanation, mankind is certainly in loss. So in other words, that Allah the Most High has sworn an oath by time, that what? That mankind is certainly in loss. <clears throat> then Sheikh Fawzan explains the word al-insan, mankind. He said it means the whole, all of the descendants of Adam. He did not exclude anyone, neither the kings, nor the leaders, nor the rich people, nor the poor people, nor the free people, nor the slaves, nor the males, nor the females. So al, in the word al-insan, this alif and lam, to make it mankind, he said, is for istighraq. Again, a rule from Arabic grammar. The al in the al-insan is for istighraq, to make the word all-inclusive. In other words, to make it mean al-insan, all of insan, all of mankind. Now, al at the start indicates it refers to all of them. Sheikh Fawzan said, all of the descendants of Adam are in khusr, are in loss meaning they will be in khasara and halak. They will be in loss and destruction if they waste this precious time. I mean, the time that's already been sworn by in the oath, time. So all of mankind will be in loss and destruction if they waste this precious time and they utilize it in disobedience to Allah and in doing that which will harm them. And this time, which is very cheap with many people, I mean, many people treat time as being a very cheap commodity. So he said, and this time, which is very cheap, with many people, time seems prolonged for them. <coughs> they become weary and bored, and they say, "Nuridu qatl al waqt." They say we want to kill some time. So they bring amusements, or they travel abroad to spend a holiday, and just to spend some time somewhere. Or they laugh and joke to use up time. So those people, they use it up and waste it. Then it will be loss and regret. It will be khasara, loss and nadama, regret. Upon them on the day of resurrection. And it would be, or it, and it could be, the source for their true happiness, for their sa'ada, if only they took care of it. I mean, this time which they, re, which they waste, and therefore it, it will be loss and regret for them on the day of resurrection. It could be, if they used it properly, it could be the source for their sa'ada, for their bliss and their true happiness, if only they took care of it. So all of the descendants of Adam are in loss and destruction except for those who have the four qualities which are, I mean the four qualities referred to in this surah, the four qualities that the author, Shaykh al-Islam, mentioned here. All of mankind will be in loss and, loss and destruction except those who have the four qualities which are al-ilm, knowledge and al-amal, action, and ad-da'watu ila Allah, and calling to Allah, and as-sabru ala al-adha, having patience upon any harm which is caused, having patience upon any harm which the person meets. So whoever has these four qualities will be saved from this loss.
and having Iman in Allah is not possible except through, through ilm, except through having knowledge, which is knowledge and awareness of Allah. وَعَمِلُ <clears throat> الصَّالِحَاتِ So the first part of the second ayah, which I have explained that, as just as the author brought it. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Except for those who have Iman, and as Shaykh al Fawzan said, and having Iman, having true faith in Allah, is not possible. Except through having knowledge, which is knowledge and awareness of Allah. And the next part of the ayah, وَعَمِلُ الصَّالِحَاتِ and they perform the righteous and correct deeds, Sheikh Fawzan said. Meaning they perform the righteous deeds from the wajibat, from the obligatory duties, or mustahabbat, and the recommended duties. So they utilize their time in performing the righteous deeds in that which will benefit them in their deen, in their religion and their dunya and in their worldly life for even worldly action even action for the dunya even action of the dunya even worldly action contains good and can contain reward if it is done with the intention of using it as an aid upon obedience. It's an action from the action, actions of this world, but if it is done with the intention of aiding upon obedience to Allah, then that action earns reward as well. So how about action for the hereafter? So what is important is that you do not waste the time. Rather, you use it in something which will be to your advantage and benefit you. And then the Shaykh, Shaykh al Fawzan quotes the next part of the ayah, Watawa saw bil haq, and they enjoin each other with the truth. The next part of the ayah explain those who are accepted from the loss and destruction, those who have iman, those who perform righteous deeds, Watawa saw bil haq, and they enjoin each other with the truth. Shaykh Fawzan said, they command the good and they forbid the evil and they call, they give da'wah, they call to Allah, the mighty and majestic and they teach al-ilm al nafi' they teach beneficial knowledge and they propagate ilm, knowledge and good amongst the people. They become callers to Allah, the mighty and majestic. And then the Shaykh quotes the last part of the ayah, وَتَوَى صَوْبِ sabr. And they enjoin each other with sabr, with having patience. Shaykh Fawzan said, they have sabr, they have patience upon whatever strikes them. And then he explains the meaning of sabr. Firstly, in the language, and then what it's meant in the texts and in the legislation. So he said, as sabr in the language means al habs, means restraining. Sabr in the language means restraining, withholding, re restraining. And what is meant by it here is. Habs nafsi ala ta'atillah. Restraining oneself upon obedience to Allah. You know what's meant in the ayah? What's referred to in the ayah is that. Restraining oneself upon obedience to Allah. That's what they enjoin each other with. Then Shaykh Fawzan makes an important point and says, and it, referring to sabr, patience, it is of three types. Wahuwa thalatha tu anwa al awalu sabrun 
على طاعة الله الثاني صبر عن محارم الله الثالث صبر على أقدار الله Patience, sabr, is of three types. I mean, there are three, kind, three kinds of patience that we need to have. The first one is patience upon obedience to Allah. The second one is patience in keeping away from those things which Allah has forbidden. And the third one is having patience with those things which Allah has pre-decreed will occur. Having patience with those things that Allah has preordained to occur. And then Shaykh Fawzan breaks each of these three down and explains them. <coughs> so the first of them, sabrun ala ta'atillah, patience upon obedience to Allah. Because the nafs, the person's soul, desires laziness. And it desires relaxation. So therefore a person must force it to have patience upon obedience. And he has to work against his, his soul to push it to have sabr upon obedience to Allah because the soul by naturally desires laziness and relaxation so therefore the shaykh said so therefore a person must force it to have patience upon obedience and upon the salat upon the prayer and upon fasting and upon jihad in Allah's cause even though it may dislike these matters He should cause it to have patience and he should restrain it upon obedience to Allah. And the second, I mean the second kind the second kind of patience is sabrun ala sabrun an maharimillah. Patience in keeping away from those things which Allah has made forbidden. The Sheikh said, the nafs, the soul, desires forbidden things, and shahawat desires. It inclines towards them and is, and is attracted to them. So therefore the person must bind it and restrain it away from the forbidden things. And this requires sabr, this requires patience. <coughs> and it is not easy to prevent the soul from desires and forbidden things. Whoever does not have sabr, whoever does not have patience, then his nafs, his soul, will overcome him and incline towards forbidden things. And then Sheikh Fawzan mentions the third type of patience, the third type of necessary patience. The third is as-sabru ala aqdarillahi al-mu'lima. Having patience with the painful things which Allah has decreed. Al-masa'ib, the calamities which strike a person. From the death of a close relative or loss of wealth, or illness which befalls a person. He must have patience, he must have sabr upon the preordainment and pre-decree of Allah. And he should not become vexed, he should not become angry and vexed and cross. He should not become vexed. And he should not become angry Rather, he should restrain the tongue from niyaha, from wailing and forbidden lamenting, and from tasakhut, from displaying anger. And he should withhold his nafs, withhold himself 
from jaza, from vexation. And he should withhold his limbs from striking the cheeks and tearing the openings of the garment, the front opening of the gar the front openings of the garments. This is sabr, this is patience upon calamities. And when calamities strike, then these things, are, three things are necessary. Withholding one's, one's heart and one's soul from feelings of vexation and anger and dissatisfaction and, and the like. And withholding one's tongue from expressing anger at what has happened, what has been decreed to, to occur. And withholding one's limbs from these forbidden acts, striking the cheeks and tearing the clothes. This is the sabr, the patience upon calamities. Al-Masa'ib. But as for Al-Ma'a'ib, so upon Masa'ib, calamities which Allah has decreed will occur, we have to have sabr, we have patience. The Shaykh said, but as for Al-Ma'a'ib, as for faults, things which are wrong with the person that he's accountable for, guilty, guilty about, as for faults, then he should not have patience upon them. Rather, he should repent, do tawbah. He should repent to Allah and flee away from them. However, with regard to masaib, calamities, which, you are, which are not something which you yourself have done, rather they are from Allah, the mighty and majestic. He has decreed that they will occur to you as ibtila and imtihan, as a test and a trial or as uquba, or as a punishment for you, for sins which you have committed. In the calamities of Masaib which occur to a person, then it will be either for that, either Allah has decreed it will occur to you as, as a test and a trial, or as a punishment for some sins which you have committed. Shaykh Fawzan said, just as, just as there is, just as occurs in his saying, he the most high, وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٍ Surah Ashura, the 42nd Surah, Ayah 30. With the explanation, And whatever calamity strikes you, then it is on account of the sins which your hands have committed. And Allah pardons and does not punish a great deal. Shaykh al-Fawzan said, so if a musibah, if a calamity strikes the Muslim in his self or in his wealth or his children or his close relative or one of his brothers from the Muslims, then it is upon him to have sabr, to have patience and to have ihtisab, to, exp to await reward. He the Most High said, and then he quotes the two ayahs, الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ أُولَٰئِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَلَوَاتٌ مِّنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَرَحْمَةٌ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ, ال... وأولئك هم الْمُهْتَدُونَ Surah Al-Baqarah, the second surah, ayahs 156 to 157. With the explanation, those who in the context of the people of sabr, the people of patience, those who, when a calamity strikes them, they say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Indeed, we belong to Allah and we will certainly be returning to Him. Those people, upon them is salawat, upon them is praise from their Lord and mercy. And they are the ones who are guided. And just as a side point in explanation of this ayah, then Shaykh Muhammad ibn Salih al Uthimin, rahimahullah, he mentions in his explanation of, and his explanation points of benefit from Surah Al Baqarah, he said, with regard to these people of patience, obviously the three qualities, three qualities are mentioned for them that they will receive salawat from their Lord and they will receive rahmah, mercy. 
and they will be upon guidance, huda. So with regard to salawat, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Prathimin mentioned, the scholars differ about its meaning. What's the meaning of salawat? The scholars differ in that regard. But the most correct of the sayings is that it means athana alayhim fil mala'il a'la. What salawat here from their Lord means, it means that Allah the Most High will praise them, mention them with words of praise to the highest company of angels. Back to the explanation of Sheikh Saleh al-Fawzan. Then Sheikh al-Fawzan said, this is as-sabr, this is patience. And from that, from the patience upon calamities, from that, <coughs> is having patience upon harm which comes in calling to Allah the mighty and majestic. For that is from the masaib, that is from the calamities. So it is upon you to have patience upon whatever you meet from harm upon the path of good. And do not turn away from doing good. Because some people wish to do good. However, if something which he dislikes faces him, he then says, it is not obligatory upon me to enter myself into these matters. And he's calling to, some, calling to something good. He wants to do good. He wants to call to good. Then something meets him unexpectedly, which he dislikes, some harm or the like. Sheikh said, then some people say, when that happens to them, it's not obligatory upon me to enter myself into the like of these matters. Then he abandons teaching if he is a teacher. He abandons calling to Allah. He abandons giving the khutbah if he is a khatib, one who gives the khutbah in a mosque. He abandons leading the prayer, the imamah in the mosque. He abandons commanding the good and forbidding the evil. This person has not had sabr. He has not had patience upon the harm which came to him. And if you are upon a khata, if you are upon error, then it is upon you to turn back to the truth and to correctness. But if you are on haq, if you are upon something true, and you have not erred, then it is upon you to have sabr and ihtisab. It's upon you to have patience and to await and expect reward. And to be aware and to feel that this is in the cause of Allah, the mighty and majestic, and that you will receive reward for it. And that you remember the harm which occurred to the prophets, alayhim salatu was salam and how they had sabr, how they had patience, and how they strove and fought in Allah's cause until Allah, the mighty and majestic, gave them victory. <coughs> then comes, that's where Sheikh Fawzan ends explanation of that point. Then in the main text, the author, Sheikh al-Islam, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, rahimahullah, he brings a quote, قال الشافعي رحمه الله لو ما أنزل الله حجة على خلقه إلا هذه السورة لكفتهم لكفتهم. He said, الشافعي رحمه الله said, if Allah had not sent down any proof upon His creation except this سورة, then that would have sufficed for them. Sheikh Fawzan said, in explanation, his saying, Ash-Shafi'i, he is the Imam Muhammad ibn Idris Ash-Shafi'i. And Ash-Shafi'i is an ascription to his great-great-grandfather, Shafi', who is called Shafi'. I mean, why is Imam Ash-Shafi'i carry the appellation Ash-Shafi'i into his great-great-grandfather? who was called Shafi'. And he was from Quraysh. He was from the tribe of Quraysh. From Banu al-Muttalib. From the clan of Muttalib. 
He died in the year 204. And he was one of the four Imams, al aimmatul Arba'a. And just as a side point here, as the Shaykh mentioned, Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah, he died in the year 204, and he was born, as for those who wish to know, he was born in the year 150 in the town of Gaza, the town of Gaza in Palestine, present day Palestine. With regard to the point that what Shaykh Fawzan mentioned, that his great great grand he takes the name Shafi'i from his great great grandfather Shafi'i, and he was from the tribe of Quraysh. Then Imam Shafi'i, his lineage joins up with the lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ten generations back. He was Muhammad ibn Idris, Muhammad the son of Idris, the son of Al Abbas, the son of Uthman, the son of Shafi', the son of As Sa'ib, the son of Ubaid, the son of Abd Yazid, the son of Hashim, the son of Al Muttalib, the son of Abd Manaf. And Abd Manaf was the great great grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Imam, Imam Shafi's lineage joins up with his in the descendant Abd Manaf. Back to what Shaykh al Fawzan mentioned, Hafizullah, he said, <clears throat> having said he was one, and he was one of the four Imams. And he said this saying, I mean the saying that the author quotes here, he said this saying, meaning if Allah had not sent down any proof upon his creation except this surah, Surah Al-Asr, then it would have sufficed for them. He said this saying because Allah has made clear in this surah, Asbab al-Shaqawa wa Asbab al-Sa'ada. The reasons for wretchedness, Shaqawa, and the means for Sa'ada, the means for true happiness and success. Allah has made that clear in this surah. Surah Al-Asr. The reasons for wretchedness and the means for Sa'ada, true happiness and success. <laughs> then Shaykh Fawzan explains that. So the Asbab al-Sa'ada, the means for true happiness and success, is, obviously the importance of this is clear to everyone, that every, everyone, everyone, what everyone desires is ultimate happiness and success. And true happiness, everyone will say that's what they want. So as the, the Shaykh makes clear, that's what's made clear in this surah. The means to success and the opposite, the means to total wretchedness. So Shaykh Fawzan said, so the means for true happiness and success is that the person has these four characteristics Al-ilm, wal-amal, wal-da'watu, wal-sabah fi sabeelillahi ta'ala Knowledge and action and calling and having patience upon harm in, Allah's, in the cause of Allah the Most High. If someone wants to know how do you attain true happiness and success, that's, as the Sheikh mentioned, that's the four characteristics the person needs. Obviously the first of them being knowledge. So if a person can't even be bothered with knowledge, then he's in trouble. So al-ilm, knowledge. And secondly, al-amal, action. Thirdly, al-da'wah, calling to it. And fourthly, having patience upon harm in the cause of Allah the Most High. The Shaykh said, so Allah's proof is established upon his creation through this surah. Allah the Perfect says to them, I have made clear to you the means for true happiness in this short and brief surah. Then Shaykh Fawzan mentions a point and clarifies something which someone may misunderstand. And the Quran, all of it, and the Sunnah are details for these four matters. I mean, the rest of the Quran and the rest of the, and the whole of the Sunnah are details for these four matters. However, this surah has made clear the means to true happiness and success in general terms. Through it, the proof has been established upon the creation. 
And the texts of the Quran and the Sunnah give the details and clarify these four matters. Then the Shaykh clarifies what could be misunderstood. And the speech of a Shafi'i does not mean that this surah is sufficient for mankind, even if Allah had not sent down anything else. I mean, it wouldn't be, someone might, might ask if this surah is sufficient, then what, why, what about all the other 113 surahs then? What about the rest of the sunnah? Shaykh said this is a misunderstanding. Obviously the rest of the surahs and the rest of the, and the sunnah are a clarification, the necessary clarification of that. So said, that's not the meaning of what Imam Shafi said. <coughs> then he said, but rather it is that Allah has established the proof upon them. Or rather it, the surah, has established the proof upon them. That's the meaning of what Imam Shafi said. The surah establishes the proof upon them. It would be sufficient to establish proof against them. Because Allah has made clear in it the means to true happiness and the reasons for total wretchedness. So on the day of resurrection, no one can say, I did not know the means to true happiness, and I did not know the reasons leading to total wretchedness, when he has read this surah, when he has read this brief and short surah. And that's where Sheikh, Sheikh Fawzan ends explanation of this quote, and then he follows it with a quote from Imam al-Bukhari. So he brings, he's brought the surah, Sheikh Fawzan explained the surah, then the author brought the saying of Imam al-Shafi, stressing the importance of this surah. So we'll leave that part of the explanation and what follows from the text till next time, inshallah, but just something small in addition to that. Then in another explanation of the book, The Three Principles, the explanation of a doctor, the Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Al Qasim, who is an Imam of the Masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina, and the Khatib gives a khutbah there. He mentions in explanation, in his explanation, he mentions some nice points here and some quotes from Ibn Qayyim. So he says, the deen, the religion, all of it. Just to make it very clear so nobody gets confused, this is outside what Sheikh Fawzan's explanation, that's the end of Sheikh Fawzan's explanation of this point. This is just something extra. So the Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Al Qasim said, The religion, all of it, is Iman, true faith, and action, and da'wah, and calling to it, and sabr, and having patience. The religion, all of it is that, those four things. Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he said, the Salaf, the predecessors, were agreed upon the fact that a scholar, an alim, does not deserve to be called Rabbani. This great term for the foremost scholars, Rabbani. A scholar does not deserve to be called Rabbani until he knows the truth and acts upon it and teaches it. So whoever knows and acts and teaches, then that one is counted as one who is great in the kingdom of the heavens. A quote from Ibn Qayyim in his book, Zad al-Ma'ad. So Surat al-Asr, the Shaykh continues, so Surat al-Asr draws attention to the fact that mankind, all of them, are in loss, except those who are accepted from that by Allah. And that is the person who has completed his own faculties in knowledge by having Iman in Allah. And who has completed his physical faculties through acts of obedience. So through these two, comes about his completeness in himself. And then he strives to complete others by enjoining the other person with that and commanding him with it. 
And that is gained by sabr, patience, which is the limit of completeness. Again, he said, Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, said, all of the people of intellect have said, bliss and na'im cannot be attained by living a life of bliss. And ease and relaxation will not be attained through ease and relaxation. I mean, a person who wants the bliss of the hereafter and ease and relaxation in the hereafter, he won't get it. He won't attain it by striving for bliss in this life and by striving for re relaxation in this life. He will not attain that through that means. And that whoever gives preference to the delights I mean of this world will miss out on the, on the delights, the true delights. Then he said, just he mentioned some further points, but just to make it brief, he said further on, Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he also said, completeness al-kamal is that a person is complete in himself and seeks to bring about completeness in others. So this surah, despite its briefness, is the most comprehensive surah in the Quran with regard to all good. That's from the book Miftah Dar al Sa'ada. And just to finish, he mentions, the Sheikh mentions. So this surah is from Al Mubashirat, is from good tidings or from the warnings for a servant. I mean, for each and every individual, this surah can be one or the other. It'll be good tidings or a warning. So let the servant stop at it and weigh himself in accordance with it. Ibn Rajab, Al Hafiz Ibn Rajab, rahimahullah, he said, This surah is a mizan, this surah is a scale, is a balance for actions. The believer can weigh himself. In a, he can weigh himself with it. And it will become clear to him whether he is in profit or in loss. I mean, obviously meaning, and that, that's a quote from the Ta'if al-Ma'arif. I mean, in the light of what the point Sheikh al-Fawzan made clear, the four points there, that knowledge, action upon it, calling to it, and impatience upon that. If a person weighs himself in the light of that and sees where he is with regard to that then he can weigh himself in the light of that and see, is he in profit or is he in loss? So the Sheikh finished. So this is a surah which fully deserves that it should be said about it what the Imams have said about it because of its tremendous status. Alhamdulillah, sallallahu ala Muhammad. Any points of clarification? Subhanakallahumma bihamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik